Welcome one, welcome all, and welcome to Cataclysm, A Second World War. This video series is going to be playing through a game of Cataclysm, the full game from 1933 until whenever it ends, and I will be playing all of the sides, all three sides, played by me, with a lot of strategy discussion interleaved in between. I hope it's uh, enlightening for those of you learning or trying to learn how to play, and I hope that it also provides some entertainment. So today, let's start by discussing the strategic situation at the outset of the game that the three sides have to deal with. First, let's look at the Soviet Union. They are, by the way, this video assumes that you have at least some understanding of how the game works. We're not going to go into every single rule. We're just going to be playing through. I'll discuss and reference some rules as we're playing, but I'm not going to go into detail. Uh, if you want to check out my rules video, it's linked here in the top right corner right now or in the description. Uh, it goes over all the relevant things that you'll probably need to know uh, in order to enjoy this video to its fullest. So let's start with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has very few units on the board at the beginning of the game, like most of the other factions. They do still have three full army units, but two of them are de dedicated sort of over in the Pacific here to make sure the Japanese don't get cute. Uh, so if they brought all of them over to the European theater, they would certainly look a lot better. But here's the big advantage that the Soviet Union has. There are only a few places on the map that you can actually cross from one part of the map to the other, and you can see them here. Over here you have the B connector, and then there's a C connector down here, and then in other parts of the map, if we scroll down a little bit, we can see a little more. There's a D connector right down there, and then there's an A connector that connects the two pieces of the United States to each other. But, as far as the Soviet Union is concerned, the only thing that connects them to the Pacific map is this B connector on the top right here, and the Urals is a, uh, what's the word, a remote area. You can see in the small text there, it says USSR units only. It's just representing the vast distances that are in the Urals and beyond into Siberia that it's just too far for any other power besides the Soviet Union, for example, Japan, to attempt to invade this eastern part of the map from, uh, sorry, this western part of the map from this eastern part of the map. So there's no way for Japanese units to ever cross from Siberia into the Urals. It's just not allowed by the game. You could get there through Persia, but in order to do that, you have to go all the way down and under through India. There's just no way to do it within the mechanics of the game. So the Soviet Union gets to sit back and feel good about, hey, I don't have to worry about invasion from that direction, but there's still a lot of work to worry about over here because... At Every territory you lose, of course, counts as negative victory points for you, and every time they lose one of these, they have to suffer a stability test. And if the Soviet Union collapses, it usually means they're not going to win the game. So guarding these territories, for that reason, is still very valuable. In addition, you can pick up quite a few victory points over here, and more importantly, flags, by making sure you keep control of these areas and get some vital supplies down to the Chinese communists or to the GMD. You could actually support either side of the Chinese Civil War. So that's sort of the Pacific map situation as far as the Soviet Union is concerned. Uh, they do want to hold on to it, but if they lose it, it's not going to be the end game. They can always take it back. They can't possibly lose their core area here with all their resources and their capital just by losing the Pacific map. However, in combination with losing these three territories in a row and losing a bunch of territories in the European map, that could bring them down. And that's often a strategy that the fascists would uh, attack with. So one of the main considerations of the Soviet Union is try and build up your commitment as fast as possible. Not only because you're going to have to maybe fight a two-front war, but also because you have these po this posture thing is a big burden on you, but better is you've got these two resources, the special Volga resource and the special Euro resource that you will get access to only at mobilization and total war. So getting to those sooner rather than later can really boost your economy and allow you to get a, an effective end game. Uh, if you take too long to get there, it can be very problematic for the Soviets. So they have to, A, build up a defense against an early invasion from both directions, because that is a legitimate strategy that the fascists might pursue. you got to disincentivize that by building a lot of fortresses and armies and air forces. And they also need to ex advance along the commitment track as, as fast as possible. 
To facilitate that, they don't have to worry too much about collapse because they've got the no retreat rule that allows them to roll an extra dice on stability tests and propaganda tests. That's very helpful. So that's their strategic situation. Where are they going to... So that's how they, what's they have to worry about. That's how they're going to lose the game. How are they going to win? The Soviets are just going to win probably in the final two turns by taking as many victory point locations as possible. Of course, it's great to have a start. They've got these two. They could maybe pick up a third very easily in China. Those Chinese ones are easy to lose thanks to the crisis table, however. They could maybe pick up Manchuria if Japan... Uh, is not defending it well enough and they're involved in a war with the allies, then that's an, a legitimate place that the Soviet Union might jump in and grab that just to get the resource and the victory point, especially if it's easy for them to hold. If they have to fight Japan all by themselves, the Soviets are in a much weaker position over here. But if the J Japanese are fighting in a naval battle, there's no way the Japanese can sustain this land battle against the Soviets and a naval battle against the allies. So that is an, a possible late game addition to the Soviet uh, war machine. But other than that, they've got these three northern states that are that are not not easy to invade, but at least they have no armies in them. So they're they're often neutral and they're often armyless, which lets you go in and attack them. Now they do have the adverse terrain that makes them a little harder than places like Poland, but Poland has its own minor army. Romania does too. The Baltic states, of course, is an obvious easy place for them to get victory points. So all of these neutral places are generally good spots for the Soviets to expand in the mid game if they are left alone. Getting those early victory points can be very helpful. If they go into war with the Germans, they can maybe, if they're really lucky, they can go in and grab both the resources in Germany. That has happened in some games uh, where the Soviets got extra lucky with the dice, and that can allow them to win the game, because then they've got the four, Reese's in, four resources in the home area, plus Romania, plus the two resources in Germany, and that is a lot of war offensives added into those uh, resources. So, that's their strategic situation. They're going to want to win in the late game by conquering a bunch of territories and win on victory points in the final turn. The allies, on the other hand, also tend to have a long-term strategy. They are very weak at the very beginning of the game, uh, thanks to uh, switch to switch back to the map here. Sorry, thanks to the status quo marker. Um, so the allies with this status quo marker, are very hobbled by it, basically. As long as the status quo is in play, they the Britain is going to be short two resources every turn, and they're not going to get any flags. That really, really hampers their ability to gear up and build things as fast as the other factions. Um, the good news for the Allies is that as soon as the Axis ever get in a position to do some fighting, or when they do start the fighting, that just status quo gets out of there. So the allies, again, are going to have to wait for the long-term game. They cannot set the pace. Only the fascist or the communist player can set the pace of how the game is going to play. So what the allies need to do, if you ask me, their, their, their most precarious situation. Obviously, France is in trouble, right? They're, they've got two land powers directly adjacent to them, controlled by the same player that's going to want those valuable resources. France themselves has a very weak effectiveness, making it very easy for them to collapse. And uh, so, yeah, France is probably going to go down. If France goes down, that's sort of expected. If France doesn't go down, the Allies are in a fantastic position. Uh, but the, the UK is the key. The United Kingdom cannot collapse. If they do, the Allies probably have lost the game. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for the Allies to get enough victory points if the UK collapses, even if they don't surrender, because it breaks their alliance with the United States, and that makes means the United States doesn't have the ability to invade Europe unless they already have control of something there. So maybe late in the game if the UK collapses and the, and the United States already has boots on the ground, that's fine. But early in the game, if the UK collapses before the United States has gotten troops into Europe proper, that could be game over for the Allies. So that's the thing to avoid. Just like the Soviets, you want to avoid collapsing early to a two-front war. The British have to avoid putting their troops in a situation that it could cause a disaster uh, because early on, that's the only thing that's going to cause them to lose stability. An invasion is not really possible early on, but towards the mid-game, it's definitely something to watch out for, and that could certainly trigger a collapse. So for the Axis, the, the fascist player, they've, they get a lot of choices in this game, like most World War II games. They could play either a long war or a short war. 
The long war is the historical strategy. It's where you slowly try to build up more troops than your opponents while they're stuck under status quo or while the, the, the communists are stuck with their crappy posture rules and things like that, right? And then eventually, at the right moment, you bust out into mobilization commitment and start taking resources. That's key because if you look at just the resource values in the beginning, one, two, three, even if you include the American resource, four, five, six, for the entire fascist power is six. The Americans have more resources than the entire fascist power. And then you throw in the six that the French and the British have, and you've doubled, you've more than doubled the fascists. So obviously the goal of the fascist player in a long game is to wait until about the mid game, quickly take as many resources as possible, and then don't collapse. That's all they have to do because they will have the most victory points just by virtue of those early times when they're trying to grab the areas in France or uh, Japan is certainly going to have quite a few victory points in China just from getting the resources that are in here, like these, uh, these resources hidden behind the units of the Chinese armies. So just by virtue of going after those resource areas, the fascists are almost always ahead by 10 plus points in the first turn or two after they bust out and start their invasions. Uh, but the key is then you have to survive until the end of the game with that long war play, right? You have to survive all the way until the end of the game and still have the most VP. And that's very difficult because the fascists are generally going to be fighting a two front war. They're going to be fighting against the Soviet Union and the allies together. Uh, because the Soviet Union at that point has no incentive to attack the Allies and not a real ability to do so either, generally speaking. Uh, and the Allies have no incentive to attack the Soviet Union. And this is a game of gang up on the leader every time. It's a three-player game. That's how it's supposed to go. That's the self-balancing mechanic. If the fascists get beaten down to the point where they're no longer winning, the Allies and the Soviet Union usually go to war with each other. Or at least that happened in one game. And so when I say usually, I mean in that one time it happened. So... That's the long-term strategy. Hold up, hold up, don't break status quo, don't break status quo until it absolutely has to, then bust out, take as many resources as possible, and then just hold. Fortress Europa. The other option that the fascists have is a short-term strategy. It's opportunistic. If we, as the fascist player, for example, can see that France is very weak in the early part of the game, it might be worth breaking status quo to grab those resources really, really early because there are two possible ways to run the short game. The short game meaning you end the game before 1945, by the way. And there are two ways the fascists can force that to happen. The first is by knocking out both France and the United Kingdom. That is the end condition where one power forces two other powers to surrender. That ends the game immediately. Whoever has most victory points wins. 99% of the time, that's going to be the fascist player if they manage to do that. The other option is you knock out the Soviet Union, period, all by themselves. Because once all powers from an ideology have surrendered, that ends the game as well. Victory points determine the winner. And the Soviet Union is the only ideology in the communist uh, ideology. So the only power in the uh, communist ideology. So either of those options work. Trying to do both of them is kind of impossible. So either the Germans uh, have to go whole hog and maybe the Italians can come, though I've never seen the Italians ever get anything over into the Soviet Union just because they have to watch their, their flanks here uh, from the British. But the Germans hit from this side and the Japanese hit from this side and you do a combined attack that just takes place after place after place, forcing stability test after stability test. That is one way to force a surrender on the Soviet Union. Uh, but... It's a lot harder to force the Soviet Union to surrender because they're rolling that third die all the time. Um, and their counterattacks are generally going to generate flags they can then use to rebuild their stability. So it has to be a lightning strike when they don't have a lot of opportunities to counterattack. Remember I said opportunistic. If the Soviets don't have a lot of offensives in the cup and you've put a lot of offensives in the cup and then you increase your commitment to total war and you get a lot more offensives, you can win it in that turn, hopefully, before the Soviet Union gets to get some war offensives and build up their own offensives to counterattack. So that's a possibility, uh, but difficult uh, for a number of reasons, because once you start doing that, the U.S. are going to start shipping them resources from Lend-Lease, and the British are going to try to put pressure on your western flanks. So you have a very limited amount of time. Again, it's all about opportunity. If the Soviet Union is at wavering 
that is the only time you might want to try that strategy. If they're at stable, it becomes a lot harder and a lot less likely to succeed. If they're at unstable, absolutely do it. You could end the game by taking one spot if you get lucky, right? So that's absolutely worth it. But usually the United the United uh, uh, Soviet Socialist Republic, the Soviet Union, is not going to sit at unstable for long. So you have to be, again... The short game is all about opportunity. If France and Britain are both weak, if the British units are out of position, if they've uh, lost a fleet to Italy, then suddenly this whole thing of collapsing France and the Soviet Union, uh, the, Brit the, the United Kingdom, that looks more tasty and possible. Okay, so that's the that's the overall strategy of the of the of the players. The the Soviets are going to try to win in the late game by just taking as many victory points as possible. The Allies are going to just try to win in the late game by uh, pushing out and taking as many victory points as possible with their massive uh, sort of uh, armament provided by the United States. And the fascists are going to pick either a long strategy or a short strategy or call an audible on one of those. It's certainly possible with all the different things that go on in this game that an opportunity might present itself where you shift your strategy from long to short or vice versa. So with that having been said, let's jump into the game. All right, we start with the sequence of play, the administrative phase. Uh, we get to gain flags. So we get check out over here at the player board section. We're going to gain some flags here. So the, the Italians get to gain a flag. They're going to choose Il Duce. The Germans are going to gain a flag. They get to choose. They get two flags, actually, thanks to their Knight of the Long Knives ability here. The Japanese get a flag. The Soviet Union does not get a flag because they are on military reforms. Not great for them. They could suffer a stability test to gain a flag. And you know what? The Soviet Union is going to choose to do that for a number of reasons. Flags are hard to come by for them, and yet, it, and yet it's really important for them to get up their commitment. And because they roll a, a third die, it makes it about a 44% chance, even if they're looking for sixes, for, uh, for them to... Uh, pass a stability test. It's a decent odds. And later, if they switch to political purges, it'll be a 70% chance. No, you know what? Is it more important for them to get to rearmament? I think it's more important for them to get to rearmament. They might have to waste a flag later, but getting to rearmament is more important. So they're going to take the second flag. The first one, by the way, is in there from the beginning of the game uh, as part of the setup. That's to represent the Russo-Japanese war that took place uh, in the early part of the 30s there. So we got to take a stability test now for the Soviet Union, and that's going to be three dice, thanks to their propaganda, sorry, um, their uh, no retreat special rule, and it's going to be minus one, thanks to their posture situation here, their military reforms. Oh, I'm sorry. Back up a second. Let's get things right. The military reforms negative uh, only affects propaganda rolls, not stability rolls. So that's why this makes more sense, because they've got a 70% chance to pass this stability check with three dice looking for fives and sixes. They got a five. That is a success. So they're good. I think taking that flag as a result, and we just look at that calculation, it's 70% chance of passing. Taking that flag is probably worthwhile for the Soviet Union on the first turn when they're stuck at the military reforms. Okay. And then finally, none of the allies can take a flag for free. However, the British and French can choose to take a flag if they want to suffer a, st suffer a stability test. Now, for them, they're only rolling two dice. Actually, the French are only rolling one. Uh, so it's much weaker odds, 55% chance for the British. If the British were at stable, I would say this, was, this would be worthwhile. But I do not think it's worth risking a collapse for them because, I mean, they lose, even if they collapse early, it's not as bad, but they lose their reserve. They lose these, they have a chance to lose these cubes in Iraq and Jordan. And France definitely doesn't want to lose these cubes over here. That's how they generate a lot of their flags from the uh, Axis trying. If they lose all those cubes, the Axis can just take all this stuff and the only people they provoke are the Soviet Union. You don't want that. You want flags. So no flags for the Allies at all. Now we move on to production, starting with the lowest effectiveness and working our way up. That would be the French. The French have two resources, the Provence resource and the Paris resource over here. And with that, they get to convert it uh, two to one into one production. Now, for the French, it's almost always going to be you build a fortress, right? Uh, man, you don't want to build that fleet. It would be nice to have an extra fleet for sure, but the fortress is just more important. So we're going to take that, we're going to put it on the turn track, and that's their build. That's their whole build. They spent it on that fortress. Next, we go to Italy. Italy has only one thing to build, and yet they cannot build it because they only collect 
one resource, the one in Lombardy. And at civilian commitment, it costs two resources to get one build. So instead, the Italians have to take the resource and put it in their production holding box. It's going to go in reserve for them. And that's all that they do. Next, we go to the British and the Americans. They get to go next. The British have two resources. They can't collect from anything other than Canada and the United Kingdom, uh, London, rather. So they get two resources. So they get one build, just like, uh, just like the French. What are they going to build? They get to choose to build either an air unit or a land unit. Well, as we mentioned earlier, losing land units as the British is their biggest worry in the middle of the game until they get at least a mobilization where they get three dice on uh, stability tests. So I'm going to say they will build the air unit because that way they can assist France, who has no air units at the beginning of the game. And then we go to the America, uh, the U.S. The U.S. has, uh, well... They have a total of seven resources, four up here and another uh, three over here. But one of them is going to the Japanese every turn, the U.S.-Japanese trade rule at the start of the game. Obviously, they want to end that, but for now, they're stuck with six resources, and a two-to-one, that lets them have three builds. So the Americans uh, are looking at their force pool, and they're going to say one air... And maybe a naval unit? Mm, yeah, why not? Uh, naval units take longer to build, so why not get them out of the way early? So the Americans are going to spend one build on the plane and two builds on the naval unit, which goes on the turn track. So we bring that over here, and it's on the turn track, along with the French fortress. So at this point, uh, we move on to the communists. Communists are sitting on two resources, Moscow and Caucasus. That allows them to build one thing. They are going to take the army because they, they just have such a large territory. They cannot cover it all, so you might as well build the army. So that's their build. Next, we go to the Japanese, who are actually at rearmament at this point in the game. Now, they get a total of three resources. They get their Tokyo resource, the U.S.-Japan trade, and they've got Manchuria. So three resources turns into three builds at rearmament. And it's hard to say no to the carrier upgrade at the beginning of the game because you've only got one carrier fleet at the start and you've got a total of four fleets, two built and one unbuilt. And the carrier upgrade... You're going to want to build that three times so that all your fleets are built all the way up before you start a war with the with the allies. And let's see, one, two, three. We can delay that one turn and build the last carrier in 1941. So let's instead of getting the carrier upgrade, let's build the other fleet because that fleet costs two and it takes a while to get out anyway, so let's put it out. And then for the last build... We've got, uh, let's see, two infantry and one air on the map. And we could also put out a logistics base, though we don't have any need for it yet. Let's get one more army, because if there's anything we're going to lose, if we do any fighting at all against uh, the Soviet Union or China, it's probably going to be land units. So two builds for the uh, fleet and one for the army uses the total of three. Now we go to the Germans. The Germans are at a very weak position. You can see the first thing they absolutely want to build is an air unit because they have none, but they can't. They only have one resource. They don't collect the Ruhr resource because the Rhineland, sorry, is re, uh, demilitarized. So they have to do the same thing as the Italians and they have to take the resource and put it in reserve. Okay, that's the entire production. We'll go faster through the future ones, I hope. Um, now we do final disposition. Each faction can now put things in reserve. The French don't have anything to put in reserve. The Italians have to put their uh, their resource in reserve. And then Il Duce goes into the cup. And next we've got the Americans and the British. The British will put uh, their air unit in reserve. And the Americans will put their air unit in reserve. I mean, well, you know what? The Americans will put theirs in the cup. They don't care when theirs comes out. The, theirs can't be used anyway. So they might as well save the reserve slot in case a flag comes out uh, through provocation or something crazy. So 
Next, we go to the Soviet Union. They are going to put their flag in reserve because they want to use that early. If, if you ever don't have flags in your available markers box, then you might be in trouble uh, if somebody provokes you. You don't get that flag. So the other two things go into the action cup. Uh, boom, like so. Next, we go to the Japanese. The Japanese have either their flag or their infantry. Let's put their infantry into reserve. That'll allow us to get it out on the continent and use it as a backup in case we want to attack something. We'll put the flag into the cup. Um, there we go. And that'll give us some options later. Next, we go to the Germans, who have to put their uh, resource into reserve and their flags into the action cup. Boom, done. We're done with the sequence of play for the administrative phase. We go straight to the action phase, where the powers will start interrupting each other. Uh, Germany can't interrupt, so Japan will interrupt uh, as the next highest down on the tree before anything is pulled from the cup, and they will uh, deploy the unit into Tokyo. <clears throat> I'm sorry, construct it in Tokyo, their production site, and then uh, deploy it over to Manchuria. So now they're in a position to attack. Now, here's the other thing that the Japanese have. The other way they could have gone instead of building the fleet would be to build an offensive and try to hit Hebei uh, early. Uh, the reason they might want to do that is because... Um, Oh, you know what? We played the Americans wrong. Let's fix their... <laughs> Let's fix that. Uh, the American Air Force needs to come out of the cup. I'll just put it here for now. And where else? Do we have any other American things? No, that was the only thing they put in the cup, right? Because they put the fleet. Okay, so actually, let's leave the... Uh, let's take the Air Force and put it back on their force pool. What the Americans instead did is they bought... An offensive with one of their resource, uh, with two of their resources, they uh, they spent on offensives. Uh, so two resources went to offensives. Four resources went to building that fleet. That's how the Americans should have played it. The reason being is the Americans need to generate flags in order to get into the game, and one of the best ways to do that is to send aid to China. If you don't send aid to China, the Japanese have no disincentive to just run over all of China and take as much of it as possible. If you do send aid to China, every time the Japanese try to act, then generally speaking, they're going to be provoking the United States. And uh, Hebei is a good example. You can see Hebei is not within one sea zone of the Philippines, an American colony. So attacking Hebei generates zero flags for the Americans unless they send aid to Hebei. Whereas Jiangsu and Guangdong, those are in America's interests. So attacking those will provoke the United States and give them flags. So taking Jiangsu and Guangdong is a dangerous proposition you might want to hold off until later in the game, but taking Hebei is very good early on, if you can do it before the Americans attack. So one of the options for Japan was to turn one of those resources into an offensive and hit Hebei. But they didn't do that. They went for the construction instead. Uh, and part that's because uh, constructing resources, I mean, resources are very precious for the for the Japanese. And uh, they, they, just, they just want to get those units out because so, so rarely do they get the opportunity to build all their units. So the Japanese are going a little bit more conservatively here. They're not going to attack China right from step one. Uh, instead, they're going to hold off and get some offensives next turn uh, when they have uh, potentially more ability to utilize them at mobilization. That's their plan anyway. So that's what the Japanese did. They interrupted. They placed their unit out here. Now uh, we, we go to the Soviet Union. Do they want to interrupt? And the Soviet Union does not want to interrupt. The Soviet Union would love to use these flags, but... Right now, any political action they do is at minus one due to their posture. What they're hoping for is to pull the uh, the Soviet uh, home front marker out of the action cup, which will let them move the posture for free, making all their political actions much more successful. But if that doesn't happen, we'll just have to deal with it. So Soviets are not interrupting. The Americans will interrupt, and they will do what we just mentioned just to prevent the Japanese from getting cheeky. They will send aid to the GMD army in Hebei. There we go. So now uh, we move on and the Soviet gets another opportunity to interrupt. They say no, the British can't because they were the last, to, their allies were the last to play. So we move to the cup and a civil war resolution comes out real early uh, before the Japanese can act, before anybody can do anything. Uh, we have a civil war resolution. So we have to follow the chart on this one and the civil war resolution for, oops, sorry, for China 
First, we determine the status. The civil war is active because there are no garrisoned Chinese countries. There's no other powers in China, only the Chinese army. So it's active. The patrons uh, are the United States for the GMD and the Chai Coms for the Chinese. Uh, let's see. Who the, G, the GMD gets to choose who is going to attack here. Now, the Americans, if they say this GMD army attacks, it's going to attack at a disadvantage because... The Chai Coms have support and this one doesn't. If they attack with the German uh, offensive, it's going to be the same as if they attack with the American. However, if the GMD loses the, uh, a marginal victory, then the German flag disappears. If they lose here, the American flag disappears. But if they lose a large, uh, a, a decisive uh, loss, then... The GMD army up here, I believe, gets to retreat to Kahar. Or is that only if they... Uh... Oh, no, no, no. That's only on a marginal victory. So, yeah. They want to attack with the GMD army here and hope that it loses so that the German aid goes away. Um, oh, I did miss one thing. Because the Americans intervened in a country, in, a, in an area within the Japanese interest, the Japanese get a flag. I apologize for missing that. So they're going to put that in reserve. So that happened last uh, before this this Civil War poll. So now the GMD is going to attack Hubei. They both are going to roll three dice because oh, sorry, they're both going to roll two dice because neither of them have the advantage. So here's the GMD roll. It's a three. Here's the Chai Com roll. It's a six. That is a decisive victory for the Chinese communists. The losing army removes all aid and is flipped to the winner's side. Remove all cubes in the area. So the uh, the German aid marker goes away. Come here. There we go. Send to available, and this flips over, and it's Chinese now. Com sorry, it's communist Chinese now. So there you go. That is the first thing that happened, and we put the Civil War Resolution marker down here out of the way. Next, the Japanese want to interrupt, I think. Hmm. The reason they want to interrupt is just so they don't wind up not having enough flags in their available markers, and they're at full stability no, you know what? I think they're going to hold on to it for the same reason the Soviets are holding on to theirs. They've got one flag and available. They can interrupt later, and they're hoping to get the Japanese home front to come out early uh, because when they increase their commitment, they want the home front to have gone by already. So the Japanese don't interrupt, um, and the Chinese, uh, the Chinese Civil War Resolution allows the Americans to interrupt. Um, are they going to send aid to the Chinese communists? I think they might. They don't need to, do they? I think they might just send more aid to Hebei. Because if they send aid to the Chinese communists, both of those things provoke the Japanese. But the only thing that is not... Oh, you know what? They're going to send aid to Hubei. Yes. Because right now, if the Japanese attack Hebei, Jiangsu, or Guangdong, all three of those things give the Americans a flag. If the Japanese attack Hubei, only the Soviets get a flag. But now that the Chinese communists have gotten all the way out to the coast, the Americans can trace a line of communication all the way to Hubei. That's where they're going to put their second aid marker. Just like that. So now, any of these Chinese armies gets attacked by the Japanese, it's a provocation against the United States, and they get a flag. That's the reason they do that. Now, that does provoke the Soviet Union, which is not that bad for the Americans. They don't mind giving a flag to the Soviets, uh, because if it makes it harder for the fascists to expand, uh, that can often mean the Americans have an easier time later. So the Soviets get a flag, it goes to the Action Cup. All right, now we move on and see, do the Soviets want to interrupt after the Americans had intervened in China? Yes, the Soviets absolutely want to interrupt uh, because they are now out of flags in their available markers box. Japan doesn't want to interrupt, by the way. They still have one. And so the Soviets will interrupt and they will attempt what? They've got a couple of options for the political. They can, uh, well, all of them are done at a weakened state, right? So they're just going to try to increase their commitment. It's probably going to fail. Because they're only rolling two dice, and they're at a minus one, so they need a six. Oh, they got it! Okay. I was expecting to put a cube in the failed box for increased commitment, but instead they succeeded. The plan was to hopefully increase commitment only after the home front went by, but 
we were lucky, quote unquote. So increasing the rearmament does a couple of things. First, it provokes Japan and Germany. So Japan puts a flag in there. Germany puts a flag into the cup because they can't put it in reserve. Uh, and now they get to pick four new things from the countermix. What are the Soviets going to pick? Well, in their force pool, they don't have a lot left to build. So let's figure out what they want to build. I think they definitely want another army minimum, another air force minimum, probably a fortress, and probably a land upgrade because tanks are going to be very important to the Soviet uh, strategy in pretty much any game. They're mainly fighting on the land. So that's their choices, the four choices they picked to add, uh, and that's it. That's all that happens uh, to their commitment. We did the provocation for increasing commitment, and now we move on. Um, could have actually gone for the Siberian Railroad, but I didn't care about that as much in the first turn as I did increasing commitment. Okay, so that was their flag being spent from their um, from the reserve. Now the Japanese could interrupt, but they're going to wait as we mentioned earlier, for the same reason. Um, the British have an air unit in London. They're going to uh, interrupt, deploy their land unit, sorry, construct their land unit in London, and then deploy it down to Egypt. Because Egypt is pretty critical to the, to the British. We don't want to forget to have that covered by air power. So next, we go to the cup, because the Japanese choose... Uh, the Japanese are going to choose to intervene because they have no more available in, in their... Uh, available box. So yes, Japan is going to intervene, and what are they going to do? They don't want to pro provoke the Americans. They want to do everything in their power to not provoke the Americans more than is necessary. And with this, they've got two more flags. Mm. They're going to attempt to increase commitment to mobilization just because they have to, right? They have to on this turn. If they can't get to mobilization, they're in a bad spot for turn two. So they're going to spend their flag to attempt to increase to mobilization. Two dice, fives and sixes. It's a fail. So that was kind of good for them. Uh, they didn't want to do that uh, roll until after the Japanese home front comes out, but they also didn't want to waste a flag if they got a provocation later. So that failure means that they, again, are going to have an easier time doing it next time. They've made some progress on increasing their commitment, but not enough. Okay, so we go to the cup. And it's the Soviet home front. That's what they were waiting for before. But now uh, that they are at rearmament, they do have to suffer this stability test, and they do not get their extra uh, die for this, uh, thanks to no retreat. So this is just two dice, fives and sixes, stability test for the home front. They passed it. They do not lose any stability. Good job for the Soviets. Now, the Soviets also get to change their posture, and they're absolutely switching to political purges. This will get them more flags, and it means that their flags are much more effective at everything except diplomacy. And I've never found a use for collective security. I don't recommend anybody ever going there for any reason. Um, not even in any hypothetical situation I've found would I choose to go to collective security. Uh, I might house rule it to make it better to the point where I'd actually use it. Anyway, uh, so then they get to maneuver their units around uh, with their home front deployment. Now, the deployment of the, the Soviet forces over here is terrible. The air unit should absolutely be in Urkursk to support all three of these areas, and the uh, Japan, the Soviet army should absolutely be in Mongolia, because if it's not there, the Japanese can attack Mongolia and take it very quickly and easily, giving them an op opportunity to hit Siberia and cut off everybody else from supplies, even if the Trans-Siberian Railroad has been produced. So, yeah, definitely relocate your troops this way. Another option is to put your armies thusly, this doesn't protect Urkursk uh, as strongly, but it does prevent Xinjiang from being thrown out by Chinese resistance crisis events. And I think we're going to do this. If the, if the Japanese want to attack Urkursk, it's going to get us flags, which are good for us in general. And, you know, right now we're not threatened by the Germans at all, so we can bring all forces to bear against the Japanese. If they want to go, we can go. 
uh, and we'll lose a little bit over here, but no resources. We're, we're not losing resources. Until the Germans are able to hit us over here, we're not worried about this. So this is a good compromise. They can't take Mongolia without declaring war. We're pretty sure they don't want to declare war, and Xinjiang is safe from the crisis events of Chinese resistance. Okay, that's the Soviet home front. We move on. And we next get out of the cup a Soviet flag, which they just got uh, a better advantage of thanks to political purges. However, they don't have any uh, commitment needs here. So what are they going to spend political purges on? They could use it to get the Trans-Siberian Railroad. That will reduce the effectiveness of a Japanese attack because they will no longer uh, be out of supply over in the Pacific map. That's certainly a valuable option. Hmm. They don't need it for propaganda. They could pressure somebody, like the United States. It might be a little early for that. You usually don't want to pressure another power if you're not worried about them winning, and it will help you personally. So they are going to attempt to build the Trans-Siberian Railroad, which requires a successful political role, which is an effectiveness check. It succeeds. All right, so the Trans-Siberian Railroad has been built. The Soviets are way ahead of the game right now. Um... Oops, I added it to available instead of sending it to the uh, available box. I added it to the action cup. There we go. So that was their flag. They got the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Again, what that does is it means everything over here is back in supply because the restricted uh, icons are ignored by the Soviets now on the Pacific map. <clears throat> Uh, and it means they can pass through the Urals without stopping. The delay box is gone. Okay, so next we pull from the cup. It's the first crisis marker. We roll 2d6, a 5-4 result. Chinese resistance, powers with a cube in an ungarrisoned Chinese country or with no Chinese armies, must perform an effectiveness check for each. Lucky for us, the uh, Soviets rather, they decided to garrison Xinjiang and made sure that they don't have to roll for that one. So nothing happens due to this crisis because nobody controls anything else in China. Next up is the Italian home front. They do not have to make the roll because their commitment is still at civilian. So they can simply use this as an opportunity to move things around, but the only move I usually make early on is bringing the fleet out to Sicily because it gives you many more options. Uh, for uh, for example, you can fight a supporting action in the Tyrrhenian Sea or in the Central Mediterranean. Um, actually, no, it might be a little safer in Rome because it's adjacent. The fleet can still sortie all the way down to the Central. Yeah, we'll leave it where it is. There's no reason to move it at the moment. So the Italian home front is done. The next out is the German home front. That's good for the fascist powers, getting all of those out of the way early. The Germans don't have to do their home front check because, you know, they're, uh, it's unnecessary. And they're probably going to leave their forces in Silesia because uh, the North Sea uh, situation here... Uh, well, one, two, three. If they attack the North Sea from Silesia, that's very problematic. Uh, it would be at extended range. They want their fleet here. Yeah, they really do. All right, and then the, the this because this is the free deployment on the home front, they're absolutely going to move their their armies into the Ruhr, uh, Rhineland area. So the Rhineland is no longer demilitarized, uh, and that is a provocation against France and her allies, if I remember correctly. And that means just France in this particular case because they do not have any allies. I would, it would be hard, pre I don't know, there's no reason for the Germans to ever delay demilitarizing the Rhineland as far as I'm concerned. It, you just lose so much. You only have one resource for the rest of the early part of the game. No, you can't do that. So France gets a flag and they choose to put it into reserve, of course. Now that flag, they desperately need commitment increases, but they also desperately need an alliance with the British to help build more flags. Um, it's hard to say what would be best to use that flag for, but I think they're going to attempt to increase commitment because getting more builds and more units on the board helps them avoid collapse later. Um, getting more flags later is also good, but the British, as allies, don't provide a lot of of flags unless they send support to China then that could retroactively get France some flags but yeah we're just gonna the French are gonna use it to increase their nope they're gonna hold on to it they're gonna hope for the French home front to come out because they can't afford oh god they got stability problems yeah they're gonna hold on to it a German flag the Germans are going to consider increasing commitment um 
or consider trying diplomacy against Sweden. That's a provocation against the Soviet Union. Um, hmm. Diplomacy's good. Getting Benelux early is great, too. But it is critical that for every power to get out of civilian commitment as fast as possible. And the Germans are going to make sure they do that by taking this option. They're going to take a uh, commitment increase, 3d6. It was a success. So they are now at rearmament. That is a provocation against France and Britain and the Soviet Union. So that goes in the action cup. Britain goes into reserve. And the Soviet Union goes into reserve. Because usually with flags in the early part of the game, you want to keep them in reserve. So Germany... Has, they get to pick four things from the countermix to put into their force pool. So they've got two armies, two planes. Hmm. What do they want to construct early? Definitely a tank upgrade. So we'll send that to the force pool. Having a fortress early is pretty valuable because usually you've got a front that you want to defend and it's just flat out better to have a fortress there than an infantry. So let's do a fortress, an air, and an infantry. So we did the fortress, air, infantry, and the tank upgrade. Those are the th four things that the Axis, the Germans, have brought to the table. That's the end of their action. The British and the French can now choose to interrupt if they want. Uh, the Soviets also. The Soviets have one flag left and available and can't increase their commitment. They could use this flag to attempt diplomacy in Gansu, maybe get another... Get, get a lifeline out to the Chinese communists down here. Get them some aid. Get more flags that way. Hmm. Or they could try taking Chahar. Just to mess with the, the Japanese. That'll get the Japanese flags, though. But you know what? Of all the different Axis powers, giving Japan flags, it's like, well, who cares? What are they going to do with them? They could convert them to maneuvers, but they're not as effective no augmentations. All right, the Soviet Union is going to decline using their flag for now. We'll, we'll wait and see. The British are going to interrupt with their flag. They've only got the one. And they're going to try to... The French in, didn't increase their commitment. The British are going to attempt to increase their commitment. Here we go. Send to available. Two dice. Increase commitment. Success. All right, the British got it. Very good for them. They get three more things to their countermix. Uh, oh, I always do this out of order. The Germans and Italians gain a flag. And unfortunately, the Italians don't get an, uh, to choose El Duce because he hasn't come out yet. All right, now we get to add some things for the British. They need a land army. They've already got one in the force pool. Let's see. They can't add any more fleets thanks to the Washington Naval Treaty. Having a fortress in London is not the worst thing in the world. But they're also going to want tanks. So let's get one infantry, one air unit, and one tank upgrade. We'll probably get an air upgrade next time, but we're going to start with the tank upgrade because having the tanks to deal with the Germans is pretty valuable. Okay, that's all of the British commitment increase options there. Uh, so now we go to the Soviet Union who can respond. If they want, they're going to hold off. They're going to play it close to the vest. And now we go to the cup. The Germans are back. What to do with another flag here? They can't put it in reserve. They would love to start doing um, some diplomacy in Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Romania, open up that avenue towards resources, but they can't thanks to Stress Affront. And they can't get an alliance with Italy to get rid of Stress Affront yet. So I think they're just going to attempt diplomacy in Benelux. I mean, no. They want Benelux, but they don't want to give flags to the to the allies. Um, the French don't actually have any more flags to gain, so maybe this is the right time to do that? Hmm. And the British can't do too much with their flags if the French don't have flags. So let's do it. Let's gonna, we're going to try. Diplomacy against Benelux, 3d6, looking for fives and sixes. 
It's a success. The Germans have conquered Benelux through diplomacy. Now, the British and the French are going to gain a flag because that is in their interests. However, the French don't have a flag. The British will put theirs in reserve. The thing about this is, this cube is only going to remain here as long as, uh, until, like, the British try to take it with their own diplomacy attempt. I'm sorry, sixes are the only ones, uh, I said fives and sixes, but sixes was the only, uh, success possibility in Benelux, thanks to the resistance value of one. Um, they still got it. Obviously, they rolled a six. So, if the Germans can occupy this with a unit then that will prevent anybody from taking it back with diplomacy. But until that happens, the British can try to take it back with diplomacy. And I think that's exactly what they're going to do with the flag they just gained from the Germans. Um, unless they want to try an alliance with France. Man, that's a tough choice. The alliance is real good, but they have lower odds of the alliance? It's uh, fives and sixes on one die is 33%. Just sixes on two dice is 30%. They actually have a higher chance of the alliance than they do. All right. They also have a stability problem, and we already mentioned that stability is a big thing, but they could generate more flags with the alliance. So let's try the alliance as early as 1933. Here we go. It's a four. So that's too bad. The British and the French both spread a flag on the alliance, but... Uh, they were unsuccessful. Now, there's still one more French flag in there, uh, which they'll try to hold over till next turn and get the British flag to come out, unless uh, the British get provoked again. So we'll see. Soviet Union is still holding on to their flag. The next crisis comes out. Oops, did I have the German needs to actually go away? There we go. The next crisis comes out, and it is a 3-2 civil war. Roll two dice, taking only the highest result. All right, a six on the 3-2 table is Spain. The Spanish Civil War breaks out. That destroys the Spanish army and puts the Civil War marker in Spain. Now, that is interesting. It's happening a little earlier than historical, but it is a historical area uh, for that. So now we move to the... Oops, put that down here. Now we got to figure out, do the Soviets want to intervene in that civil war as they did historically? Well, if they're the first ones to place aid there, then they can get flags every time somebody else places aid there. So whoever sends stuff to Spain first wins, as far as I'm concerned, even if they lose the civil war. So the Soviets are definitely going to interrupt. They're going to attempt to send, uh, to do manu perform maneuvers, I should say. Um, although a line of communication does not require friendly ports if you're not belligerent, so they can trace all the way to Spain. Okay, so here we go. Uh, they're going to send to available and attempt maneuvers. Fives and sixes. Success! All right, so they got the maneuver which converts their political action to a military action. They're going to use that military action to send aid to Spain. Here you go, Franco. No, Franco's opponents, I'm sorry. I don't even know. The Republicans, I guess. Uh, they'll put it on the nominal left side because history. Okay. So, that's good. However, that is a provocation against France and the United Kingdom. Would you look at that? Uh, which is probably good for France and the United Kingdom, bad for the fascists. Eh, it's probably neutral for the Soviet Union. So, uh, oh, France doesn't get another flag. But the British do. They're going to put theirs in reserve. Okay. So, that's great for the British and it's great for the Soviets. And now uh, we move on. The British are not going to interrupt. They're going to try to save that flag for an alliance attempt. If the French flag comes out, it does not. The Soviet Union get another flag. They're going to put that one in reserve and try to hold on to that for a while for another possible opportunity in the future. Next out of the cup, a crisis event, the third crisis of the turn. We put the turn into sudden death mode and we trigger the crisis of 5-3. Chinese resistance again. And that, again, nothing happens. There are no cubes in unoccupied areas there. Uh, ungarrisoned, I should say. Next out of the cup, neither of these two factions are going to interrupt. Il Duce! The, Chi the, the Italians. Uh, the Chinese. Let's, uh, let's see. They absolutely want to increase their commitment because they are at stable, unlike the other fascist powers. They have something... Uh, they definitely want to increase their commitment level. And their home front is already passed. So here's 2d6 for a commitment increase. Hey, hey, super successful. No bonuses for double sixes, though. So they're uh, increasing. That gives, again, the French, who don't uh, have the ability to spend, uh, 
to gain another flag. Um, and the British also gain a flag for the commitment increase. And let's see. Hmm. What are they going to take? They can only take two things out of the counter mix. What do they need? They're going to have two fleets. If they want to play a naval strategy, they could buy a fleet upgrade right now. It would be kind of ridiculous because it's going to cost them basically 100% of their production to upgrade one fleet to a carrier fleet, though. The upgrade tokens, they're there for the Italians, but it's a hard choice to take them. Unless you're thinking the Italians are going to grab Provence, it's a hard choice. What they do need is another infantry and air force in Libya. That would probably be their safest bet. So they're going to add an infantry and an air force to their force pool, and that's all they get to add. And they're done. El Duce goes back to available. Everybody's waiting for the next cup draw, and it's a French flag. The French are going to attempt their alliance with the British again. It's at a 1d6 with a plus 1, 4s, 5s, and 6s. Ooh, Nope. That's no good. Uh, both the British and French flags are sent to available. And now they've got themselves locked into this problem. The French can't do their rearmament without throwing away this, uh, this alliance advantage that they've got built up here. Uh, but there is still one more British and one more French flag in the cup, so maybe they'll get lucky. Italy has their next flag come out. What are they going to use it for? They can't put it in reserve, so they got to use it for something. They could use it. They could attempt to perform an Abyssinian adventure. But I think attempting diplomacy in Yugoslavia is probably more valuable for them. They only hit on a six with Yugoslavia. They hit on fives or sixes with the maneuvers, but then they have to roll another five or six on the next die roll. So all in all, it's probably about the same. But Abyssinian Adventures maneuvers would give, at least give them a plus one. Yeah, they're going to attempt maneuvers with this with one die. A success. Good job. Now we're going to attempt the Abyssinian Adventure because it can only be done when they're not at war. So they might as well do it now. It's only going to have one military action, therefore one die. Five or six is a success in Ethiopia. They got it! Ladies and gentlemen, two rolls in a row. The Abyssinian Adventure is a success. Ethiopia is conquered. And the Italians pick up a free cube in Rome. That increases their victory point number by one, and therefore it increases the fascist number by one. Now they got to be a little careful because now... The total, and we didn't increase the fascist actually, and the Germans, when the Germans picked up Benelux, let's make sure we keep track of that. Uh, and I don't think anything changed over here, unfortunately, for everybody. So remember, we got to keep track of the democracy's uh, status quo marker with regards to the British and the French, which equal a total of six VP right now. When the Italians and Germans exceed that number, then status quo is removed. Right now, it's six to four. Uh, you've got the, the four French plus the two British cubes here. You've got the three Italian plus the one German cube there. So six to four. So two more victory points, uh, three more victory points, actually, uh, until status quo goes away from victory points. But these French could lose all these cubes on the left here by crisis markers real quick. Got to be careful of that. Next out of the cup, a French flag. It's going in reserve. They're going to hope for that alliance. The American home front doesn't uh, do anything, but the Americans can move their stuff around. There's nothing to move. They're years away from war, so they don't really care. But putting all the stuff that they have into California gives them more options uh, because Washington doesn't have a uh, doesn't have a delay box. So they can go from California to Washington with no delay. Uh, they can't go from Washington to California without being stuck in a delay box. So yeah. They're going to have that situation. Um, you know what? Actually, they're going to keep one fleet over here. That's just going to happen regardless. I'm going to want the Americans to help with the Battle of the Atlantic, probably, so they're going to keep one fleet over there. They're done. Next up, the British home front. The British are at rearmament. They must suffer a stability test. Oh, but they pass it. They're okay. And as far as their maneuvers... Uh, they don't really have anything to change. I think they want to keep both. They want to keep their carrier at Scapa Flow. Keeping their other naval fleet there is very uh, useful for backup. And uh, yeah, they're done. 
Um, so the next out of the cup is the French home front. They are still at commitment. They don't have to suffer a stability test. Lucky for them. Now they're going to definitely move their stuff around. They got to abandon Prov Lorraine because the Germans have this attack into Paris lined up and they got to worry about that. Remember when I said that the Germans and, and the fascists kind of have to look for opportunity? The fact that the British and the French went for an alliance instead of a stability increase, that's an opportunity. Not just yet, but it's something to keep in mind. If that stays at wavering for too long, the Germans are going to want to do something about it. All right, there's the other flag. The French and the British are going to get the alliance they'd hoped for. Here we are with plus two to the roll. Threes are better. It's a success. All right, so we've got an alliance between France and Britain. And that is going to provoke everybody on France and Britain's sheet, which is Germany and Italy. So Italy gets Il Duce back to the cup. Germany gets a flag back to the cup. And uh, now Britain interests and French interests are overlapped. Anytime France gets a flag, Britain gains a flag and vice versa. So next we go to the cup because the Soviets still want to hold on to theirs. Uh, having an extra flag for the following turn to increase commitment can be very valuable. All right, next we go to the cup and it's a Japanese flag. The Japanese are the only fascist power that doesn't need to increase its stability. What they could do is try and grab Chahar with diplomacy. It doesn't have any fists, so they've got like a 55% chance of grabbing it. And the advantage there is if they could then get Gansu and Sichuan, none of those have fists, that might be the right ticket. Uh, because if they can do all that, they can take the Sichuan resource later and utilize it to its fullest value. In addition, taking Chahar guarantees that the GMD does not get to retreat when they inevitably attack Hebei. So they are going to use... Oh, I'm sorry. The Japanese are trying to increase their commitment. All of that, and they really are just going to use it for that purpose. All right, here it is. Two dice with a plus one modifier is successful. And the Japanese increase to mobilization. That is a provocation against the Soviet Union and the United States. They get their first flag of the game here. That's going to give them some options. And before that happens, though, Japan sitting at mobilization now has to add three things to their force pool. This is a tough decision for Japan. Having tanks makes attacking and defending in the Philippines and Java area so much better. Not because you get the armor advantage, but just because you get the extra resiliency that comes with the two-step unit. However, however... The Japanese typically can't afford that. And they usually also want strong air forces in order to win the naval battles that they need to win. So they're going to get one air upgrade. They're going to get one fortress. The fortress, because I want to put the fortress in Manchuria to dissuade the, uh, the Soviets from doing anything against me when I'm fighting in China or down here or out here. So the fortress goes in there because we want to build that up early. And lastly, um, we've got three armies. That's definitely enough to deal with China right now. We're going to take instead another air force or another fortress. We can put a fortress in Manchuria and in Japan and get the air force later when it will become much more valuable to us. I think that might be the right play. Yes, we'll take the second fortress with the idea being that they take many, they take two turns to come out. So let's build them early. <laughs> you know what? Because... I am having a sort of issue in my current tabletop game where Japan got invaded before they even got to attack the United States at all. The Philippines just went, oh, you got a force in Okinawa? Well, it's ours now. Oh, hey, look, another American offensive. And they just plowed into Ch Tokyo, and I only had a regular infantry defending it, and I wished I had built a fortress there. This way, it frees up this infantry to go and help invade China or garrison it, and we can leave a fortress in Tokyo, which is going to be more resilient to attack. Um, well, not resilient, but more uh, more defensive. Okay, so those are the three things. They got the uh, the two fortresses and the air upgrade. Okay, that is done. We gave the Americans and the Soviets a flag. Soviets are going to sit on their flag again. The Americans are definitely going to use their flag. Uh, you got to use these flags as often as you can. The Americans have a choice. They could double their income by getting to rearmament, or 
they could attempt they could, they could attempt to double their income, or they could attempt to pull back the the trade with Japan, or they could attempt to get the lend lease marker onto the map. Lend lease marker has to get there in order for them to get an alliance with. France and Britain. France and Britain got an early alliance. If the Americans can get an alliance with them before the Germans attack, that would be huge. Absolutely huge. But they would be a little behind the ball on commitment. And they'd be keep sending stuff to Japan. But let's try it. I think as the American player, that's what I want to do. So Americans going to send to available, and they're going to attempt to get the Lend-Lease marker out on the board. That requires a five or a six. They got it. Wow, everybody is super hot today. The Lend-Lease marker is now in Washington, which means that the Americans can send aid in the form of resources during the production step to any powers that are belligerent if they want. Next, we go back to the cup, and it's a German flag. We know Il Duce is also in the cup, but we can't put the flag in reserve. We would like to get rid of that stress affront, but we can't. So instead we are probably going to attempt to pick up Sweden. No, you know what? Germany's going to increase their stability. Let's try. Increase stability. Propaganda roll. Successful. We don't want Germany to even come close to collapsing. Let's not be stupid here. They've got a couple more flags in there still. Next out, Japan gets a flag. We increased their commitment successfully. Now I think we are going to go after Chahar. It would give the Soviets a flag. Uh... And that's not great. But at this point, taking almost anything will give the Soviets a flag, except Jiangsu, which will give the Americans a flag, which we definitely don't want to do. So let's attempt to grab Chahar. Here is the roll. It requires five or six. They got it. Everybody's hot. Everybody is hot. The Japanese gain another victory point, And therefore, the fascists gain another victory point. You remember how I said that the fascists just start creeping up there and just usually get like 10 VPs ahead. Uh, okay. So Jahar is captured. That is a provocation against the Soviet Union. That's the only one there. That's the only interest that they're in. So the Soviet Union gains a flag. It has to go in the cup. Because they have no more available, they are going to interrupt before the next pull and they're going to use their flag. And what are they going to do with it? They can't do propaganda. They could try diplomacy. It's a little weaker than it normally would be, but, uh, yeah, if they tried it in Romania, that would be useless. They could try it in Sweden and grab the Swedish resource before the Germans could. Maybe. No, if they do that, the Germans are just going to use their flag, to, but that'll get them more flags. Um, hang on a tick. We're going to attempt maneuvers with this flag for the Soviets. Here we go. Two dice. Failed. It doesn't really... You, you always go, Ah, oh, what am I going to do? All right, let's try this. And I agonize over the decision. Then they roll poorly anyway, so it doesn't matter. So they got one in the maneuvers box. Next out of the cup, a German flag. Germany can't hold on to it. Already has their stability up. Doesn't want to aggravate the allies. So let's grab Sweden. 3d6. There it is. And, I mean, that's good, but it's also like, oh boy, we've, uh, we've pissed off the French and the, uh, the Soviets again. They're going to get another flag back. Uh, and we are now one VP away. Let's see, the Germans are at two. Uh, that means it's uh, five to six right now for the stress affront, or sorry, the status quo check. So if the Germans or the Italians get too many more VPs, then status quo goes away, and they do not want that to go away until, like, 39. So they need to keep status quo in check for another two turns, if at all possible. All right. The Soviets are going to interrupt. What are they going to do? You know what? They're just going to try and take it back. <laughs> if they're successful, they're successful? I don't know. Uh, Germany doesn't have any but what one flag left in the cup. So, yeah, Soviet Union is going to try to take Sweden. Here we go. 2d6. Sixes only. Fail. All right. It was worth a try. They don't have anything left to do with that. Ah, but they did get an infantry unit. That is going in uh, the European map for sure. Leningrad. No, let's put it in Belarusia. Or, you know what? Let's put it in Ukraine. 
Um, and they they couldn't I, I focused on moving stuff over here, but they could have also moved stuff during the home front, and this is absolutely what I would have done earlier. Attacking into Romania can be very valuable for them. All right, so when you go back to the cup, the French flag comes out. They're going to use it as a propaganda roll because these are actually no longer in the alliance box. Propaganda roll for the French. Dang it. Go to your home. Control S. Is a two. No good. But they got a little cube as compensation. The Soviet roll. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> they could really screw the axis right here. If they attack Romania and capture it, it makes it real hard for the Axis to keep status quo in effect. But at the same time, you know what? The Soviets don't want to give too many advantages to the Allies. The Soviets can't beat the Allies later on. They need the Germans to fight the Allies. So we're not going to do maneuvers with this. Instead, uh, we're going to try to take another swipe at Sweden. Here we go. 2d6. Sixes only. There, they got it! That is a provocation against Germany. And Germany loses one... And the Soviets gain one. So Germany gets a flag. They can't put it in reserve, so it has to go in the cup. The Soviets have just spent that. Uh, and what the Soviets are hoping for here is the turn ends, and they get to gobble up the Swedish resource before the Germans take Sweden back, right? That's a losing game overall, because every time the Germans roll, they get three dice, and, the, and they don't have any penalties, and the Soviets have to get sixes on two dice. But they're hoping to get lucky, because now... We know there are two German flags in the cup, but there's probably not enough stuff in there. And two is just barely enough to keep the turn going uh, at rearmament. So maybe the Germans miss a roll just before the critical time? I don't know. They're pl the, the, the Soviets are playing with fire here, but they don't have a lot to do with their dice except maybe grab the Baltic states, which is also a provocation against Germany. So they might as well provoke them in a way that lets them hold on to Sweden, if at all possible. Next out of the cup is the German flag. They can see what's going on here. They are going to use their uh, 3d6. Now, by the way, a good time to do this to someone is when they have stuff in the failed political action boxes. If Germany tried to increase their commitment and failed and there's a German cube here, that's when you take their stuff because then they're like, oh, well, I don't want you to have that diplomacy thing that you just took from me, but I have to increase my commitment. Because otherwise it's a waste of that cube. All right, but Germany's definitely doing 3d6 on Sweden again. Maybe they get unlucky. It's looking like they got it. Woo! That's good for them. And the Soviets gain a flag. Uh, that's interesting. This is, oops, not two, not two flags. This has gone back and forth quite a bit. And we have to... And da, 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 da. there we go. Uh, and fascists are actually, I'm sorry, at seven, I believe. They're at uh, uh, two plus three is five, uh, plus two is seven, yes. And the democracies are still at six, if I'm not mistaken. All right, so the Soviets have this flag. They don't know quite what they're going to do with it. So instead of, uh, oh, actually, we didn't actually switch the flags out here. Germany did get their, get their hands on it. There we go. Um, I don't think that... I don't think the Soviets want to keep playing this game. Uh, they're probably going to lose it. So instead, they're just going to hold on to this flag. They're going to hold on to it. Next turn, they're going to keep the flag and maybe get another one from the available markers box. They've got one thing in here. Yeah, the turn could end soon. They were going to want to keep that extra flag for next turn when they could be stronger, they could be better. We'll see. Here we go. Next out of the cup, German flag. The last German flag in the cup. What do they want to do with it? They can't keep it in reserve. They can't get an alliance. They can't. They could declare war. That's a really bad idea. They can't increase commitment. They could pressure the Italians. The Italians already have one in there. Maybe they pressure the Japanese because the Japanese have been on a roll with diplomacy. Yeah, Germans are going to pressure the Japanese. Here we go. Fives and sixes is a success. Japan gains a flag. Japan can't interrupt, however, so we wait and see what's out of the cup. A Soviet flag. They have to do something again. Uh, the Soviets are going to attempt maybe to get Gansu, uh, but that would provoke the Japanese too. What are they going to want to try and do diplomatically? Let's get the Baltic states. Here they go. Baltic states is a provocation against Germany, but it's something they want to have as a stopgap 
uh, and prevent Germany from having an easy attack directly into Moscow. At least if... Is there anything they can take that gets them more provocations, though? Bulgaria, maybe. If Italy takes Yugoslavia, then that's a provocation. Um, and that's obviously... I'm looking for things that don't have any uh, fists in them, because that's how the Soviets are going to actually get stuff diplomatically. Now, they could also turn this... Oh, actually, they tried maneuvers last, didn't they? So they could try again. Let's do it. Oh, no, they lost that cube when they were doing the diplomacy crap in Sweden. Um, I was thinking they could send aid to, to Jiangsu. Let's try it again. Sending aid to Jiangsu uh, for maneuvers. 2d6, we need fives or sixes. Got it. So the Soviets are going to send aid from the maritime territory. Now they, they can trace a line of communications through here thanks to the uh, uh, Trans-Siberian Railroad. They can now trace down here to Chang Jiangsu, and they're going to send a flag that away. Um, that would provoke the United States and Japan. And as we mentioned, we're a little worried about the Allies getting a little too strong here. We don't. We do want to screw with them. But not this turn. Let's just put it in Hebei. So the Soviet aid is going into Hebei, making it less likely that the uh, Japanese are going to do anything without provoking the Soviet Union. All right. But that does provoke Japan. Japan gains a flag. It goes into the cup. Japan is going to use its flag to attempt to get control of Gansu. Here's the diplomacy roll for Gansu. Fives and sixes. Wow, this is insane how successful these are. Uh, that is going to be a provocation against the Soviet Union. They're going to gain a flag. Uh, we forgot to put the other one back in here. Um, and the Soviet Union, sorry, the uh, Japanese gain a victory point, increasing the fascist total. They're now one away from getting Sichuan. That's great. Uh, okay. The Soviet Union is going to intervene. Now, this is actually kind of bad if they were to do that. They're going to try maneuvers again and maybe send some aid to Jiangsu so they can have aid everywhere. No, they're going to attempt to get the Baltic states here. They don't mind pissing off the Germans because they don't have... The Germans are very limited in what they can do with their flags without giving provocations. So, But the Japanese seem to be doing too much over here. They don't want that. So they're going to attempt to get the Baltic states on their side. Uh, so here we go. 2d6, but sixes only succeed. I can't believe it. This is like the most successful diplomacy I have ever seen by anybody. By everybody, actually. Um... So now, the Soviet Union gains another VP, and the J Germans gain a flag, which has to go in the cup. All right. Turn could end very soon, but there's the German flag right out the bat. Huh. What else do the Germans want to do with this? They can't send aid to anywhere except they could send it to Spain. Would you give another flag to the Soviets? But that's basically the same as trying to grab Finland, which is my other thought. Anyways, here's maneuvers for the Germans to try to send aid to Spain. I forgot about that at all. There we go. The maneuvers conversion is successful, and they're going to send aid to Spain. That is a provocation against... Oh, geez, that's a provocation against France and the UK and the Soviet Union. Oh, God. Okay, well, they didn't think about that, but oh, well, they, they did it. So there's some flags for everybody. Oh, I put them in the cup. I shouldn't have put them in the cup. They're going to put those in reserve for sure. France is going to put this in reserve. The UK is going to put this in reserve. And the United Soviet Union is also going to put theirs in reserve. So that was the German flag. They did successfully get some aid to Franco. But it's not enough to actually give an advantage to that side. It just stopped the other side from having an advantage. But having that Spanish resource would be nice. All right. Who's going to interrupt first? The Soviet Union, what do they have to do with their cube? Or their, with their flag? Just like last time, they're going to hold this till next turn. They might need it to increase to mobilization, um, to increase their commitment. Okay. So uh, the British are going to interrupt, and they... Nope, they're going to let the French interrupt because the French need to increase their commitment. Uh, oh, no, sorry, the French need to do propaganda. Here we go. 1d6 with a plus 1 is 4s, 5s, and 6s is another failure for the French. 
Good job, French. All right, now the Soviet Union could interrupt, but just like last time they're holding off, the British can't because of the same ideology. The Soviet Union gets no choice now, must use a flag. Ugh, let's try Sweden again or Gansu? Sweden's probably the better thing to do here. Uh, 2d6, sixes only. They finally fail. That's what's been, by the way, keeping this up, is the Soviets have the lowest chance of any of these flags doing anything when they try diplomacy, but they kept getting successful. Uh, okay. So, that missed. That gives the British the ability to send a flag to the French or try to pressure the United States. I think they want to keep the French strong, though. So send a flag. to the. Here's a pressure roll for the British, 2d6. It's successful. The French gain a flag. And I did that thing again. There we go. All right. And next, out of the cup, Il Duce. He successfully invaded Ethiopia last time. He could attempt to grab Yugoslavia, but that would end the status quo. Can't do that. Il Duce can't hold on to it either. Damn it. He could attempt to grab Hungary. That would just piss off the French and give them more flags. Greece would give the British a flag. Ugh. They've already increased their commitment. It's tough to find something to do with this when you can't put it in reserve and you don't want to use it. We already did the maneuvers thing. He could send aid to Franco. Hmm. Yeah, he's going to attempt maneuvers. Here we go. 2d6. Also successful. I don't know what's wrong with this die roller. It seems to be always putting a 5 or a 6 in one of these. Uh, and yeah, he'll send aid. Why is there only three Italian aid markers here? They should have four offensives. They didn't... Oh, they've got one being used as a resource. Duh. Here we go. So that is a provocation against France and the United Kingdom, unfortunately. That sends one French flag to the cup and one British flag to the British Reserve. And now, the French are going to interrupt and try to get their propaganda roll. I think that still doesn't do it. Even with a plus two, they can't do it. Ugh. Well, I guess that makes up for the fact that they're getting all these flags from the Axis. Uh, the British are going to interrupt and try to send a flag back over there again. Here's 2d6 for pressure, and that's a fail. Now they're starting to fail. All right, the Soviets are getting holding onto their flag for next turn in the hope. Hold on a sec here. This very well may be the longest first turn I've ever seen in this game. We still haven't pulled the fourth crisis. It's in there, right? Let's just... Yeah, the, the, it's in there. We just keep missing it. All right, so that was a failed pressure from the British. Now the French, uh, sorry, the, the next pull out of the cup is a Japanese flag. They're going to try to get Sichuan. That actually doesn't provoke anybody if they can make it happen. It's in their interest now. They've gotten this little curve going behind the Chinese armies. Here we go. 2d6, fives or sixes. Oh, it finally runs out of gas. There we go. All right. Well, it was worth trying. Next out of the cup is the Japanese home front, which is at a minus one for them. That's not going to be pretty. Here we go. That's a failure. They needed a six to stay up, so they lose one level of stability thanks to being at, uh, at uh, mobilization. And next out of the cup is the crisis marker, which will end the turn because there is only one French flag left in the cup. All right, that is turn number one. Let's just do a little bit of cleanup here. The French flag goes to the French holding box. The Soviet flag goes to the Soviet holding box. And the German reserve goes to the production box. The Italian reserve goes to their production holding box. And that's the end of 1933-1934, ladies and gentlemen. And we now take everything from the turn track and we put it back into the cup. That didn't work. We have to do them one at a time. Um, actually, we can just do control A, can't we? There we go. Everything is back into the cup. We turn the turn track to 1935. Oh, I did that wrong. <laughs> wow, I am. All those things in the turn track actually get dispersed to the appropriate place. 
Here we go. This goes to the Japanese, this goes to the American, and this goes to the French. Now these things can go to the cup. Okay, so now we're ready for the next turn. I hope you guys come back for the next turn. It proves, uh, hopefully, to be even more exciting with combat and things. Uh, well, 35, 36, not a lot of combat, but I think we're going to see some invasions in China and some combat uh, very soon. So thank you for joining us. We will see you next time.